small business is about courage, risk-taking, independence, and we small business owners are survivors. Everybody has an idea for a business, but how do you take that idea from mind to market? This is the place to learn. Small Business School with Hattie Bryant. It's a new kind of school. Together we'll learn about business from the inside out, from the people who've done it. We'll meet the men and women who are today's pioneers and quiet heroes. Their lives are the textbooks. Our classroom is the world. Hi, I'm Hattie Bryant. This series is about small business, and today you'll learn about a lemonade stand that has gone global. Every week we introduce you to the founders and operators of small businesses. From Tampa to Seattle and from San Diego to Boston, owners tell us how they do what they do. We call this 30 Minutes a master class. The teachers are real business owners who teach you out of their personal experience. This is probably what most of us picture when we think of a lemonade stand. It's the archetype of American entrepreneurship. This is Charlie's lemonade stand, and Charlie Aberg works hard to quench his customers' thirsts on a hot afternoon in Dallas. In Cranston, Rhode Island, we found a lemonade stand that's been around for 50 years, and business is still growing. This is Rhode Island's pride and joy. Ice, lemon juice, and sugar mixed just right and frozen. It is refreshing. So how many Dells do you think you've consumed? Oh, quite a few. Probably about 1,000, 2,000. Since I was little, I've had them. Dells is so popular, both the mayor and the lieutenant governor showed up to celebrate Dells 50th anniversary. Here is one family that has grown a business to where it's really a very recognizable product. Uh, even outside our borders, and in turn employs a lot of people. Fifty years ago, in 1948, Angelo De Lucia sold his first Dell's frozen lemonade from this spot. Today, there are 45 franchises operating in eight states, and you can even buy a Dell's in Tokyo. Angelo, when did you first taste this recipe? Uh, when I was about 10, 12 years old, my dad used to make this in front of his house on a street. And then the war broke out and it just stopped. There was no more sugar and no one to buy, so he decided. And it was 10 years. And uh, I came home from the service and they sent me to dental school. I was a dental technician. Your parents sent you to dental Did you want to go to dental school? That was the government. No, I had to be rehabilitated back to civilian life oh. through an injury. Okay. So anyways, I had a partner who gambled the money that we made in the, in the dental business. So I, in turn, decided to close it down and go into the bowling business. Wait a minute. You had a partner in the dental business that lost your money by gambling it right. away. Right. So, so what did you do with this partner? Did you just walk away from it? Did no, you? I dissolved the company. Okay. And uh, my father and I, we decided to buy this building next door called Oak Hill Bowlerway. So my father could not stand the pin boys, and he left. He left me with a, uh, an absorbent mortgage. So I decided, well, I'll put up a little 10 by 10 little building next door because lemonade was unheard of for 10, 11 years. Years ago, all the Italians of Federal Hill all made a lemonade. Ice cream and lemonade. It was one of the most popular thing going. And these are recipes they brought from home, Absolutely. from Italy. Right, right. And everybody would do it themselves. Everybody would do it themselves. And they would always do it to their satisfaction, their right. taste. And that's how we started with a little um, White Mountain ice cream freezer, rock salt, and ice. I couldn't stand the fluctuation of the lemon acidity. Some lemons are tart, some lemons are sweet, some don't have enough juice, some of them are too thick. So I had this Tony Manera Quality Guard Laboratory, we worked together, that I made what they call a set pattern of ingredients. I mean, I wanted to be certain that we had the blend of product to be every batch, not to be... Uh, not to be inconsistency with the... So way back then, your goal was to standardize the flavor. Absolutely. 
Because you knew that if you made it different every time, It'd people would say, this didn't taste like you gave it to me yesterday, Angelo. Absolutely. I'm not going to pay you for this. Right, right. And that was done with uh, chopped ice around a stainless steel tank in a little bucket. And I got tired of turning a wheel. So I decided to put a motor on a, on a rack. And I got two belts <laughs> and put them together. And we put them around the, around the big wheel. And we would help it along. It made it very easy to make the product. Because it took about 15, 20 minutes to keep turning and turning. So you became an engineer out of necessity. Yeah, it was something that I didn't think I did anything spectacular. It was just, you know, and I was doing five gallons, selling maybe one or two, running back to the bowling alley, watching the pin boys, staying open. Did you start the stand to generate more dollars? Or did oh, you yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sure, the bowling alley, but there's no, no, uh, no participation in the summer, no air conditioning. People would just, well, they... Okay, so it was to level out your cash flow through that's the 12 sure. months. And That's right. Dells will squeeze nearly four million lemons this year. The large freezer stores juice, pulp, and skins, all important to the secret mixture. We do all these peels during the winter. They're whole lemons. We, we have to dice them up ourselves. We have a machine that does it. Right. Then we have to package them. We freeze them here. So, like, because in the summertime, you don't have enough of time. At what point did you say, okay, my future's in lemonade? 1955. Or my future's 1955, I decided... The wife decided, not me. She yeah. says, you can't have this seven day a week, 365 days. You have no family life. So I decided to sell a bowling alley and go into permanently into Dell's, which was doing very well. And I bought two table talk pie trucks. And I cut the side out of both of them and painted them and sent them on the road to sell the product at the baseball block dances. And that's how we ended up with 2, 4, 6, 10, 12, 15, 18, 20, 20 mobile units. And I was running them all over the state. Where did you get the startup money to even buy the bowling alley? Before I was married, before I went to service, I worked in a place called Uncas Manufacturing Company, 32 cents an hour. When I came home from the service, I had $5,000. That you'd save by earning that 32 saved, cents an hour. That I've saved on my own. I never drank, never smoked, never ran around, never had a car. We put that money into that bowling alley, and we went to a, a bank called Centerville National up in West Warwick. And Mr. Yorston, we told him what our problem was. He says, you look like two hard-working Italian couple. I'm going to invest $25,000 on my name into your endeavors. And he gave us, gave us twenty five thousand nineteen forty nine. Wow! A banker looked at you and right. liked you as my wife. human beings. Right. You didn't have the no collateral. No, we just put the down payment. You didn't have payment. a P and L. You didn't have a financial nothing. statement. No, you didn't, no, nothing. You just walked in. Walked in a little building, in, into his little office, and he says, "You look like two good Italian." He made it very pointy. Hard said, workers. Hard working kids, and I'm going to, I'm going to invest twenty five thousand dollars into you, but. It meant working 8 in the morning, 1 at midnight with the bowling alley. And then in the summer, starting 3, 4 in the morning. You because you had one machine to try to make 100 gallons. It's very difficult. And I decided, uh, well, i got to expand. How am I going to expand? And I opened a place in Tai Oak Avenue, 1961. My first franchiser. Okay. I bought the land, paid cash for it, put up the building paid cash for it, put all the equipment in it, and I got one of the drivers, and I said, would you like to become owner-operator? I ain't got no money. You don't need any money, I said. All you got to do is pay me a dollar per bottle that makes five gallons on consignment wow. with a guarantee that I give them a $10,000 net or I put the difference. But you have to work the way I got to tell you. You got to start early in the morning, you got to be there that day, and you got to run two mobile units out of the location. Worked out very nice. He's still down there. 1961. The fella's still down there. And he's making money. Yes, and he just opened a satellite, put his son in it. The following year, I opened the second one. The year after that, I opened the third. The year after that, I opened the fourth. And the fifth. Okay. All on consignment. Okay, the teaching moment now. 
to uh, other people could learn from you about this. And, and so what would you say when you want great, when you want to attract good people, when you want the business to be run right, maybe you need to give people ownership? Well, sure, you have to. Bruce Long owns the franchise for Newport County. I grew up in Rhode Island. I lived in uh, Whitford. And when I was a little boy, six years old, I drank Dell's Lemonade. And here I am as an adult. I have an opportunity to be a Dell's franchisee. I grabbed it immediately. And they interviewed three different people, and they accepted me as the franchisee. Oh, you had to compete. I had to compete. So you would recommend Dell's to someone who's looking for a business? If you're looking for a business, you're willing to work very, very hard for three or four months and make an annual income. This is a perfect place for it. But it's an owner-occupied type business. It must be owner-run. This is not a business for a lawyer that's going to hire managers. It doesn't work. And how do you know what's a good location? Well, in the winter, I used to go on in location like Lake East Province. I sit there for hours counting out cars with a clicker. And I leave, and I look at properties, and I'd look at, I'd say, well, there's a nice piece of property. It's on a corner, 100 by 100. I could put a little 20 by 20 building on it. So I go into the city hall, look at who owns it, forget the realtor, and go up to the, and listen, I'm interested in your property. Mm -hmm. How much you want for it? Well, we were looking for 12,000. Well, gee, I gotta knock that building down. Can you, can you make it there? Uh, how about 10,000? It's uh, good, it's okay. Give him the, I give him the money I own the property. <laughs> We help people with developmentally delayed adults mm -hmm. live and work in the community. Joe so Riley's nonprofit organization, uh, Better Community Living, that, owns a Dell's franchise. Uh, to get people jobs in the community is very difficult. Mm -hmm. So as a uh, alternative to it, we decided to come up with a business to bring into New Bedford that would get people jobs. We chose Dell's because it's a uh, wholesome, family-owned business. We wanted to get a business that was gonna come into the community and that would be in the community and would be able to build skills for the people we serve. Dell's will generate five million in sales with six full-time employees at the home office, 45 franchise owners with about 300 employees serving up the icy treat in the summer. And what do you do around here? I uh, do a little bit of everything uh, between making mix for Dell's and selling franchises and selling Dell's, period. You know, all okay. those things. You've been here 43 of the 50 years of the company's existence. Yes, I have. 43 years, and I started out picking up papers in a parking lot and just worked myself up to the uh, position now where I'm still picking papers up, but other things too. We can look uh, at the liquid products. The responsibility for quality control and new product development falls into the hands of Dr. Dmitry Kazantsis, a PhD in food science. The future is exciting and challenging all the time because the preferences of the people are changing by the day and uh, you have to follow the trends. If you don't follow the trends, uh, you cannot stay in the market. As you grow and add locations uh, and get just get bigger, are there more OSHA, are there more federal regulations, rules and regs that when you're selling a product that people consume that you have to pay attention to? And that's one of the real reasons we need a, a doctor or a, a PhD in food science to be here. We have to keep up with the new regulations and the new uh, laws that are existing, not only nationally, but we have specific regulations for each and every state and county sometimes that are different. Or for, of course, for other out-of-state and out-of-country, specifically franchises, we have to deal with a whole new bunch of regulations. Also, the franchise in Japan is looking into new products right away, including the powder lemonade that and we're so developing. That's what I was going to say. What's the next step? Uh, two or three years from now, we won't see the jugs coming out of here, right? We'll see packages. We're not going to have the syrup anymore. We're going to have just the powder and all we add is the local sugar and the local water, so filtered water. When that happens, is it going to be more cost effective for everyone? It is going to be more cost effective, not only in terms of shipping, storage, and simpler to use. No spillage, no refrigeration, and easy to transport. Are you having fun? Of course I do. This is a challenge for me. All right, now, it's got to have sugar, it's got lemons, it's got filtered water. What else is in there? Uh, we have a couple things that we try to keep uh, 
under uh, lock and key, which are the secret ingredients, basically. So you're not going to tell me? Uh, we try to keep it uh, secret as long as we can. It's it is a secret. There are ingredients in here that will never be exposed to outside the... Okay, so when I taste this, I'm tasting... He's dead, you know, if he tries to do anything. I'm, oh. I'm putting it on, putting it on the table. The chemist is dead if he tells anybody. <laughs> oh, he'd go back to, he'd go, he'd go back to Greece. <laughs> but, he's going to go back to Greece. But it tastes like water, sugar, and lemon. Right. And you're saying there's something else Oh, in yes, there. there's an ingredient to this. The lemon is the most important. When we make the product, you will not like it coming out of the machine. But it's the lemon rinds that get into the product after an hour, ferments the product like wine with grapes. Mm, but it's it the no lemon one. that starts all the acids and all the oils and all the in the lemon skin eventually gets into this product and seems to blend and give you a real nice refreshingly different taste. <laughs> Angelo De Lucia is a true business visionary. Who should franchise their business? You don't have to sell hamburgers or mufflers to franchise yours. Angelo did it because he understood the power and pride of ownership and the power of having a great diversity of locations. He could attract more talent by franchising than simply by hiring employees. Keep this in mind. All businesses have a product, processes, and people. If you want to develop a franchise organization, you must have a product and processes solidly in place. Your franchisee supplies the people. Angelo had his recipe, Dell's Lemonade, and he had the processes clearly defined. The processes must include standard operating procedures so that your product looks and, in this case, tastes the same no matter where the customer experiences it. Dell's franchise owners serve up the same delicious beverage in Tokyo as Angelo serves here in Rhode Island. Franchising can be a great way to grow your business. It has worked for thousands of companies, and it could work for yours. The business community loves our show. One owner says, you're motivating, informative, and inspiring. Another calls us insightful. One says, it does my soul good. Another thinks we are the true reality show. And we're called the best business educational show on television. Want to learn more? Join the thousands of small business owners who are making a difference and add your voice to our story. Visit us online at smallbusinessschool.org. Angela, what does it take to run a business? Huh. you got to have good health, mm -hmm. fortitude, mm -hmm. and believe in what you're doing. I mean, I, I find, I don't know how this thing ever developed the way it did. I always say my customers made it possible. I did nothing in this. I gave a product, and they, in turn, rewarded me. Okay. I mean, I, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. Of course not. I mean, but I gave a lot of product away. I wanted people to know what it was. I would serve 100 people. Five people would refuse. 95 would take. I always said there's a narcotics in that product. Once you've had it, you've got to have it. <laughs> okay, Angelo, one, one parting moment here. If you could tell a 25-year-old who's just opened her or his business. I put him, I put him right in that chair, and I told you? Bruce and I told Joey, don't give any quarters. You tell them this is a hard income business. You got to work with it. You got to have. You got to be at it as often as possible, even when you're sleeping. Think about it. And remember Charlie's lemonade stand in Dallas. Charlie is learning his own lessons. Thank you. Now, Charlie, I heard that the joggers who come by get special treatment from you. What do you do for the joggers? I let them pay later if they don't have the money. <laughs> so you trust them to come back? Yeah. Well, do you think you're going to own your own business when you grow up? Yeah. I think I am. Okay.
John Morgo, our marketing advisor, gives us some money-saving tips. John, as small business owners, we're conservative. We're afraid to spend money. We're afraid to go to an ad agency or designers to get help. But this example shows why it's probably smart. This restaurant started mailing these pieces, and they were paying premium. What's wrong with these pieces? Well, uh, first of all, they're oversized. And because they're oversized, they're probably trying to attract attention, but they're paying a surcharge. Hmm. Paying a surcharge for being oversized. On this particular piece, not only is it oversized, it probably in the, in the design is going to cost them more to tab it or somehow seal it. Mm -hmm. So now they're doing this. Right. Well, what they've done here is uh, they've gone to a standard size. The Postal Service has a group of specialists that are available to work with small businesses. Mm -hmm. If you go in and you talk to the specialists, what they'll do is they'll show you a template. They'll show you what is the standard size. They'll show you the oversized. They'll show you the trade-offs. Um, I'm not suggesting that you should all mail standard size. You shouldn't use overs. I'm just suggesting that depending on what you're looking for, mm -hmm. you might want to look at both options. In this case, um, I think what you're going to find is that you can probably make more mailings because you have a total mailing budget. Mm -hmm. Now you need to decide, you know, do I want to make more mailings? Do I want to get the impact? It's not how much money you spend. It's how much money you make when you're talking to the experts. Don't be afraid of them because you don't have to buy anything. Ask them for a proposal. Ask them for options. Mm -hmm. What you want to do as a small business person is not just go with your gut reaction. Look at options. Go to the postal service. Go to the letter shops. Go to the printers. Ask them for options. So what we want is results. That's right. And this is, right. this is getting, we've right. talked to these people, this is getting right. just as much result as this oversized, mm -hmm. and it's less money. Well, I think that the, the key in any direct mail program is you've shown three different pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, what you want to do is measure the results of each one. Uh, I can't emphasize enough that small businesses should take each mailing and measure the response rates from each mailing. For your business and your customers, there may be a formula. And the only way you're going to know what the formula is, is if you measure the response rates. If you're a small businessman and you work with the numbers, you're going to become a big business. Angelo understands the power of pride of ownership. If you are willing to let others own a piece of your idea, perhaps you should think about the very successful business model called franchising. We'll see you next time. Small Business School with Hattie Bryant. If you want to learn more about starting, running, and growing a business, come to our website, smallbusinessschool.org. There are streaming video and interactive study guides. The only way we can compete with big business is to be faster, smarter, and better. We are the engine of the American economy. We create the jobs. Small business is about big commitment. It's about sacrifice and struggle. But we do it because we say, if I don't do this, my life won't be complete.